hey, uh, I messed up. I know that I said I was going to, but um, I'm really sorry. I wish that I didn't have to, but if you've ever said any of these things, or if you've avoided saying them, then you know what it's like to hurt someone that you love. You know that moment when your heart sinks, the blood drains from your face, your chest tightens, and a weight starts to build in your stomach as you realize that you've really messed up this time. In that moment, the same questions keep rolling through your head. What was I thinking? How did I let this happen? How did I not realize what I was doing? Is there any way back from this? You're not sure how you can make things right. Or you might have been on the other side of these words, or words like these, or maybe you've waited for these words, but they never came. In the aftermath, you've come to know that dull ache of brokenness, a resentment that wells up that you can't escape, the feeling that things are different now, and you're not sure how you can make things right. Your trust has been broken. Your relationship is at code red status, scrambling to hold itself together. This is the place that we find Israel and God in the book of Nehemiah. Their relationship status on Facebook is set to, it's complicated. After decades living in exile, living in foreign, unfamiliar cities, forced out of their promised land, Israel has finally returned to stand amongst the ruins of the once great city of Jerusalem. There are traces of the greatness that once was, but the Babylonians were thorough in their destruction of the city. Even coming back, it's hard to feel like they're coming home. Most of them were born in exile. So it's hard to imagine that this wild, overgrown bunch of rubble was once a thriving hub of trade, home to kings and filled with astonishing wealth. For those that are old enough, to remember Jerusalem before its fall, they can barely piece together which pile of rubble corresponds to which old structure from their dim, distant memory. Through heaps of effort, they've managed to rebuild the temple and the walls. But if you've ever been in a city that has been struck by war or natural disaster, you will know that haunting sense of loss that lingers over the ruins that created them uh, uh, long after the catastrophe that created them. My brother uh, moved to Christchurch in 2016, five years after the big earthquake. He works as an engineer, uh, but he's an amateur photographer. He took some photos of the city, and these photos seem to capture that sense of loss that lingers in five years after the earthquake, that sense of pain and healing is still going on. Let's take a look at some of those photos. Each ruin tells a story of a house that was once a home 
of a building of a business that once thrived, or a monument that once told a story but now lies fallen in pieces. In Nehemiah chapter 9, Israel stands in their own broken city. But added to the scene before them, the same questions keep rolling through their head. What were we thinking? How did we let this happen? How did we not realize what we were doing? Will we ever be able to come back from this? In their national identity, they are devastatingly aware that they have failed in their covenant with the Lord. They have no leg to stand on. Their relationship with God is at code red. And this time, they do the only thing that they can do. They come together as a nation and they pray. They pray a prayer of confession. This prayer takes up the whole of Nehemiah 9, and it goes from the story from creation right through to their present situation. And as they go through their entire history, it becomes as clear as day that they have failed at almost every turn. But God has remained steadfast in his love for them as his chosen people. Despite their stubborn attempts to do things their own way, their continued existence is entirely the result of God's steadfast love. As I meditated on this prayer, and as I acknowledge that in my sinful nature, I am neither stronger nor wiser nor more righteous than the Israelites, I too come to realize that I am entirely dependent on God's steadfast love. The Hebrew word to describe this love is chesed. This word fills the Old Testament. And it's out of this love, this chesed, that God made his covenant with Israel. This covenant was an agreement that God would provide for all of their needs, so long as they chose him as their provider. It is Hesed that gave the writer of Lamentations the thrill of hope that Jonathan spoke of earlier this month. The psalmist, psalmists constantly refer to this Hesed. They say things like, His Hesed endures forever. Bring me the word of your unfailing Hesed. This love is a love that is steadfast. It is unconditional, unchanging, and unfailing. Despite Israel's continued defiance of his will, God's attitude remains unchanged. Out of his steadfast love, he continues to provide for all of Israel's physical and spiritual needs. And he is always there. Every time Israel turns on him, he is there ready and waiting to forgive them and bring them back to his covenant of chesed. Throughout this prayer, God's steadfast love and provision for Israel comes through. They announce, you are the Lord, the God who chose Abraham and made with him a covenant to give his descendants the land of the Canaanite. And you have fulfilled your promise for you are righteous. While Israel was in the wilderness, for their hunger you gave them bread from heaven. For their thirst you brought them water out of the rock. Later on in the promised land, they took possession of houses filled with all sorts of goods, hewn cisterns, vineyards, olive orchards, and fruit trees in abundance, so they ate and were filled and became fat and delighted themselves in your great goodness. Forty years you sustained them in the wilderness so that they lacked nothing. Their clothes did not wear out and their feet did not swell. And finally, you gave them saviors 
who saved them from the hands of their enemies. Without God, Israel would have no land. Without God, Israel would have died in the wilderness. Without God, Israel had no food or water. Without God, Israel was utterly at the mercy of their enemies. Israel was completely dependent on God's love for all their earthly needs. But God in his chesed not only provides for their earthly needs, but for their spiritual needs too. Out of his love, he gave them a law. They gave, he gave them a covenant relationship so that they might live rightly with all of their provision, so that they might live well with each other. They declare this in this prayer with things like, you gave your good spirit to instruct them. And many years you were patient with them and warmed them by your spirit, through your prophets, yet they would not listen. In their words, they say, God came down from the heavens upon Mount Sinai and spoke with them from heaven. God came down from his throne and met Israel where they were at to bring them this law of love. It was a gift of love to Israel so that they could live well with each other instructing them how to live righteously. God, out of his love for the Israelites, provided them not only with all their earthly needs, but he gave them wisdom and the opportunity to live righteously. But Israel here stands, and looking back, they confess that their nation has led themselves astray at every opportunity. Even though they witnessed God's amazing provision, when they were delivered from Egypt, led by pillars of fire and smoke, miraculously crossing the Red Sea as fast as a child left in a room with a marshmallow, they snatched the opportunity to do things their own way. They had cast an image of a calf for themselves, and said, this is your God who brought you up out of Egypt. And they had committed great blasphemy. And once they arrived in the promised land, things only got worse. Israel confessed, they were disobedient and rebelled against you, cast your law behind their backs and killed your prophets. In their entire history to this point, Israel stubbornly chooses their own way. And each and every time, God provides a king, a judge, or a prophet to lead them back to himself. There's a glimmer of hope that lasts maybe one generation, maybe two. But Israel is soon back on the downward spiral. You see, Israel made the same mistakes in their understanding of God's covenant that we do all the time. For a moment, let's imagine there are two parents. The first parent loves her daughter. She dotes on her completely, serves on her hand and foot. When she wants lollies, she gets lollies. When she wants chips, she gets chips. If she doesn't want her veggies, she gets ice cream instead. But as the young daughter got older, she started to make friends with the popular crew. And these friends, they didn't really love her. But she thought that this was the best thing to be popular. And as these friends slowly disrespected her, led her into ways that she knew she shouldn't. Her mom turned a blind eye because that was what her daughter wanted. Who am I to tell her how to live? The daughter's life spirals down and down, continuing in this pattern of destruction. The other parent, though, he loves his son 
just as much. So he's not going to let this happen to his son. His house has rules, regulations. And if you don't miss the, if you don't meet those rules, there are consequences. He wants his son to be the best that he can be. So he eats healthy because we all know you don't need lollies because fruit are nature's sweets. <laughs> hey, Josh. Um, <laughs> he wanted his son to be the best that he could be, so he made him take music lessons, join the school choir, and three different sports teams. Homework hours were scheduled and compulsory. Top marks are assumed, and any failure to meet the standard makes his father not angry, just very disappointed. But under the burden of all this expectation, the poor son could never hope to meet. He is filled with this unshakable sense of shame. His self-worth hits rock bottom. His son did his best to make his father proud, but in the failures, the punishments, and the lectures, it was impossible to feel loved, to feel a sense of worth or of any hope that he could be up to scratch. So often, the first parent is the parent that we want God to be. So often, the second parent is who we think God is, or at least we're scared that he might be. Like Israel, so often we just want God to give us everything we want, to let us do whatever we want, to validate all of our feelings and desires and ignore the damage and hurt that they lead us into. Or else we feel like God just has a set of rules that we need to follow a set of regulations that we need to meet in order to earn God's love. And for so long, Israel bunny hops from one extreme to the other, failing to see the truth of God's character, failing to see the truth of God's covenant of chesed. But finally, in this prayer, they get it. As they're confessing their failure, they finally understand what it has been all about. They declare this, but you are a God ready to forgive, gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love, and you did not forsake him. But you are a God ready to forgive, gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love, and you did not forsake him. In this account of Israel's history, God's steadfast love shines through. God never ceases to love Israel. Out of love, he provides Israel with the freedom to make their own decisions but out of his love, he's always there at the end, ready to correct them from their misunderstandings, ready to help them and bring them back into his covenant of love. Here, Israel finally understand that God's love is not earned, but freely given. They finally understand that God's love is not fickle and changeable, but bountiful and steadfast. The sad end to the story is that Israel remains under foreign rule. The prayer ends with they rule over our livestock as they please, and we are in great distress. The sadder end, though, is that overcorrecting from their past idolatry, they turn to corrupt legalism. 
turning the Lord's temple into a marketplace, turning the covenant of love into an impassive legal system of spiritual hierarchy. You see, as humans, we will always end up giving in to the desires of our heart that lead us away from God's truth, away from God's goodness, away from God's righteousness. On our own, we get sick of the number of times we have to say, hey, I'm sorry. Hey, I messed up. God's love, though, did not stop with the end of this prayer. Thankfully, God's love stood steadfast through all of humanity's stubborn attempts to live their own way. Centuries of rejection after this prayer, he sent his son to take on a human life that was as steadfast to the father as the father is steadfast to us. When he died, he took with him all of our failures, all of our hurt and pain, and he buried them with him in the grave. When he rose again, he brought us back with him to the Father. And he gave us the Holy Spirit so that in his place, Not only can we know the steadfast love of the Father, but we can bring that steadfast love into our own relationships. Because as parents, as children, brothers or sisters, as husbands and wives, fiancés, boyfriends, girlfriends or best friends, in our fallen nature, we will always hurt or be hurt by the people we love. Maybe you have been hurt by someone you love. Left with this deep need for love. It can leave us feeling like a broken city, like Jerusalem lying in rubble. When we neglect the ruins of our hearts, the weeds will grow. Wild animals take over. We distance ourselves from our loved ones. We start to question whether the relationship is worth the effort. We can become bitter and callous, and our relationships will continue to suffer. As they say, hurt people hurt people. Hurt people hurt people. If you have been left with a broken heart, Jesus today is turning you to the Father who never gave up on Israel, who will never give up on you to piece that heart together. He is taking your hand and bringing you to the Father your loving Father in heaven, who will take you into his arms. He will hold you and fill you with his steadfast love. He will comfort you and reassure you. And with hearts made whole through the work of God's love, we can return to our loved ones and share that love with them. It is only by God's steadfast love that we are able to steadfastly love the people we love most. Maybe you know that you have hurt someone. Maybe it's someone close to you. Maybe it's God himself. When we hurt people, we are left ashamed of ourselves. In response, we can either succumb to guilt or we hide from ourselves the true extent of our sinful nature. When struggling with guilt, we can leave ourselves feeling undeserving of love. 
especially when this is something that just seems to keep happening. You can be left with thoughts of, I hurt people who get too close. So you push people away for their own good. Or else we can ignore our faults. Because to admit the true depth of our brokenness, of our sinfulness, it would take a hit to our pride that we know we can't take. When we do this, we make excuses for everything. I didn't mean to. I was busy. I was tired. I was stressed. They are just as bad. This is something that I do all the time. Sometimes we make excuses for our excuses. We say, if I'd told them why I was really late, they just wouldn't understand. Or I just don't want to cause drama. Or I don't want to hurt them. As though lying to them is really in their best interests, rather than a weak attempt to hide from them and ourselves that we have made a mistake. When we feel the weight of our sin, we are overwhelmed. The older I get, the more I become aware that on my own, I am selfish. I am broken. I am messed up. On my own, I rarely ever do genuine good. If I do, it's probably for the wrong motives. It's no wonder then that we can feel like we should distance ourselves from people. It's no wonder then that we hide from ourselves the true extent of our brokenness. But God's love is steadfast. Jesus reminds us that this broken sinner is not who God sees when he takes me into his arms. And it is not who I will always be. In Ephesians 1.5, Paul writes, God decided in advance to adopt us into his own family by bringing us to himself through Jesus Christ. Through Jesus Christ, God sees you not as the broken sinner that you are. God does not see me as the hopeless sinner that I am, but he sees you as his dearly beloved child. So it doesn't matter to what depths we've sink, we sink, how low we've gone, how badly we've messed up, God will steadfastly wait for us in his love. We are utterly dependent on God's steadfast love to be able to hold firm to the truth that we are beloved children with a Father who sees us without blemish, like we will be when we return to Him in the next life. So where is it that you need God's steadfast love in your life at the end of 20? 18. Is your heart in ruins, waiting to be restored to its intended purpose, with a brokenness that has you turning to all sorts of things to try and remedy it, but nothing has worked. God is waiting patiently and steadfastly, ready to take you into his arms and to let you know that everything is going to be all right. His love is enough. His love is everything that you have been searching for. Just as he provided bountifully for Israel, he will abundantly fill the bits of your broken heart. Or maybe it's the hurt that you've caused to your loved ones your own failure that has you isolating yourself in an attempt to save others. God says to you, throw it all on me. You won't be able to push me away because his love is steadfast. He put up with Israel rejecting him for thousands of years and you think that your mistakes 
are going to make him turn his back on you. His love will not tire. It will not weary. And through his son, he will accept you as his dearly beloved child, no matter how much you feel you don't deserve it. Well, finally, are you running from the truth of your sin, constantly shifting the blame or turning the attention to others, trying desperately to keep your teetering tower of lies from tumbling down? God says, enough is enough. Step into truth, because I know that you've failed. I know you've messed up. I know that you're not enough, but you don't need to be enough because my son was enough. I gave my son for you so that no matter how many times you fail, I will steadfastly remain on the other side waiting for you to return to me and accept my love. We are all hopelessly and desperately in need of God's steadfast love. No matter how we try and get around it, run from it, or experiment with every other way, there is nothing so satisfying, nothing so encouraging, nothing so exciting as coming to Jesus with all of our sin, all of our failures, all of our hurt, laying it at his feet, and just letting We can't live the lives God intended without his steadfast love. As fallen people, we tend to try and cope on our own. When we're hurt, we tend to hold back our love. But God never holds back his love from us. When we're done with our wrestling, when we're finally finished struggling, he takes us into his arms. He pulls us into a hug and he whispers, I'm still here. Come exactly as you are. I have never stopped loving you and I never will. Heavenly Father, you never give up on us, even when we have given up on ourselves. We come before you as broken people in desperate need of your love. Take us into your arms. Comfort us and strengthen us. Equip us by your Holy Spirit to be bold in our love for those we hold close. I pray this in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen.